I was asked to speak about the trends in the global context that have implications for sustainable development and growth and prosperity with a particular attention to the role that technology plays. I'm going to draw from the work that we do and I do at the McKinsey Global Institute, uh, but uh, I, should, I should emphasize that I'm not here to speak for McKinsey or for the President's Global Development Council. Uh, I want to attempt to be comprehensive, but I want to highlight uh, three important major trends, and then I'll conclude with some challenges that I think uh, we're all going to have to grapple with as we navigate the coming decade or so. The first trend that I'd like to speak about is the great, what I'll characterize as the great rebalancing. And let me talk about a few features of this. One of the extraordinary things that's happened is being the shift east and south. Starting in 1990, the world's center of economic gravity has moved both east and south, a shift that's been more rapid than at any other time in history. Uh, and China could very well be the largest economy by 2020. It's also important to think about this shift from the point of view of the private sector and from companies. By 2025, the emerging regions are expected to be the home for nearly half of the global Fortune 500. And this is quite a remarkable development if you consider that in 1980, there were only 23 companies from these regions that were in the global Fortune 500. And in, 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 around about now, we have about 130 of those that are in the Fortune 500. So quite a significant shift which also speaks to some of the issues around involving the private sector and thinking about domestic uh, resource mobilization that will, also be, that will also involve some of these companies. It's important also to recognize what's happened with prosperity, part of it in, in large part to the work that this body has done, but prosperity is rising much faster and at far greater scale than ever before. And here I'm gonna try and outdo Sean in terms of looking back uh, at, at history. If you look back to the last two or 300 years, it took Britain 154 years to double its GDP per capita, and then it was working off a base population of nine million people. China and India have both doubled theirs in only about 12 and 16 years, each with 100 times as many people. And that ex economic acceleration is roughly 10 times faster and at 300 times the scale of anything that's been previously done before. So you could think of that economic momentum as being roughly 3,000 times as large as anything that's happened in, before in history. It's also important to recognize that, you know, as recently as 1990, 43% of the population in the developing world lived in extreme poverty, earning less than a dollar or so a day. Uh, and, and it's important to know that as we look forward, uh, there's an interesting new number to think about, which is, I'll call it $10 a day. This is the level of income at which households can afford to buy discretionary items beyond basic survival and start to empower themselves and start to do things uh, that start to reinforce their economic security. I'll call this when they start to enter the consuming class. Only today, only one in five people are in fact in the consuming class. But if we look forward, uh, by 2025, half the world, roughly oh, just over 4 billion people, will join that consuming class. And half of those people will be in the emerging markets. And that will account for 70% of the growth and about $30 trillion worth of consumption by these consumers in these markets. And this is a pretty, quite a profound change. The other feature of the rebalancing that is important to emphasize is urbanization. Urb the number of people in the world that live in urban areas is growing at something like 65 million uh, people annually. And that's the equivalent of creating, if you like, seven Chicago's a year, uh, every year. And if we look forward uh, to the structure of the global economy, something like 600 cities are gonna drive close to two thirds of global GDP in about the next decade or so. And it's important to know that of those 600 cities, about 440 of them are actually in the emerging markets. And it's important here to note that we're not just talking about just the mega cities. In fact, half the global GDP growth in the next 15 years is expected to come from cities that you might call middleweight cities. And these are cities like Surat or Kumasi and Foshan. And these are gonna drive a significant portion of the global growth. And this is particularly important as we think about growth, prosperity, and inclusive growth, that it's important to pay attention to what, what happens in these urban areas, how we can foster economic development. Urbanization generates productivity gains through economies of scale, specialization of labor, knowledge spillovers, 
and, and also reinforces multiple network effects. And in fact, today, as I'll come to shortly, urban areas are the locus of many of the technology-enabled innovations and new forms of commerce and participation that we're starting to see. Second, let me shift to talking about the second major trend that's important. And this is what I'll call the growth of the internet as well as other transformational technologies. Technology has become a major force in transforming growth, both for businesses and economies at large. In fact, uh, uh, there's something called the solo residual, named after Bob Solo, Nobel laureate, uh, which tries to look at, take a look at the role that technology plays in contributing to output growth. And at this stage, at this point in history, it's considered to be about 50%. In other words, half our economic output uh, uh, is such that technology is playing some role, technology and technology innovation is playing some role. This is quite a significant change because if you look back, if you look back to the 1920s, that number was roughly about a third of output growth. So technology is now playing an important role. If we look specifically to the internet, we now have about a third of the planet's populations online. Uh, we still have about four and a half billion people who are offline. And three quarters of those people are mostly in about just 20 countries. In fact, India makes up about a billion of those uh, people who are still offline. But it's also important to recognize the contribution that the internet has already made uh, and it is continuing to make to economic growth beyond the way in which it's transformed how we all live, play, and work. So far, it already contributes about 3.4% of GDP growth uh, of GDP in advanced economies, and about 25% of GDP growth in those economies of the last uh, decade or so has been in, it can be attributed in one form or another to what's happened with, uh, with, with the internet. And in fact, this economic growth is expected to grow for both businesses and for economies. As you can see from some of the data that's illustrated on this chart, uh, developing countries have only just barely started to scratch the surface in terms of capturing the economic growth an impact uh, that comes from uh, the internet. In fact, if you look at Africa, only about uh, uh, the contribution of the internet to Africa's economic growth is only about 1%, which is about less than half the contribution from some of the other emerging economies and emerging markets. So there's still some room to grow. The good news is that by 2025, uh, we expect another two or three billion people to gain access to the internet uh, most of those will be in the, in the developing economies, and much of that is going to happen as a result of the continued technology innovations that make these technologies both cheaper and more accessible, but also market forces that, and, and also growth and prosperity uh, in those markets. The bad news is that even as we see that growth, we can fully expect somewhere between another two to three billion to continue to be offline, despite uh, what you know technological advancements or market forces. And most of those who will remain offline are mostly rural, female, and elderly. So it's going to be important that as we think about the goals for growth and development, some significant attention is paid attention to the number, the size of the population globally that will continue to be offline. Already we can see that there are basically four key barriers that are part of addressing that. A big part of it is just affordability because many of these people are too poor to be, able to, have, uh, to be able to afford the devices, the access plans, the data plans, and so forth that are needed to get access to the internet. We know that a second important barrier is infrastructure. So while some progress has been made in some regions to build broadband infrastructure, uh, investments in infrastructure are gonna be quite important to address uh, some of the barriers that we see. Then you also have to deal with incentives as well as just expanding the capacity of users themselves to be able to take advantage of these technologies. But let's also look at the fact that the, the pace of technology itself is accelerating. I think it's quite striking to take a look at, as this chart suggests, how long it's taken different technologies to get to the first 50 million people. Uh, it took radio about 38 years. Uh, it, it took the internet about three years. And you know, Twitter and Google, Google Plus is a social platform, it took 88 days. So just the sheer pace of how quickly these are getting adopted is, 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 is quite uh, uh, spectacular. And along with these technologies come the effects of digitization, big data and analytics uh, that are both broadening and deepening, all of these creating possibilities for productivity opportunities for both the private sector, but also the public sector, including initiatives such as open data, 
uh, which and another and another use of these technologies that can in, enhance and in, improve the delivery of services by the public sector to their citizens in their various countries. A lot of these technologies are also going to play the role of creating public common goods, uh, whether it's through making it easy for people to learn, get access to information, uh, as well as the, the kinds of in, you know, information that's helpful to build capacity. And we also know that these technologies are also creating new business models and new models for financing, new models for accessing and matching supply and demand, often at very micro levels, taking advantage of the marginal cost of these technologies. But even as we get excited about all these things, there's even more to come. One of the, uh, some of the work we've done recently uh, involving many researchers and, ac and, and academics and technologists around the world would point to a few transformational technologies that, is, that are only just starting to come about. And we selected these 12 on the basis of both their scale and scope, uh, as well as their potential to transform not just businesses, but also economies and society. And if you look at these, they roughly fall into these four groups. There's a set of technologies that have to do with how we use uh, technology itself, whether it's mobile internet or cloud infrastructure or cloud computing or the Internet of Things. Uh, these are all going to transform how we think about using uh, IT itself. Then we've also got technologies and innovations that are changing just the basic building blocks of everything, whether it's synthetic biology or advanced materials of one form or another. And then we've also got the new raft of technologies that enable how we access and use machines themselves, whether it's advanced robotics, autonomous and near autonomous vehicles, or 3D printing that are starting to transform how we think about industrialization and manufacturing. And then, of course, we're now starting to see huge progress and strides being made with how we, how we tackle energy and the use of energy, both whether it's in the exploration of energy, the ability to store energy, as well as the renewable technologies themselves that are starting to come to fruition. So all of this is very, very exciting and points to many, many opportunities. But at the same time, there'll be important risks and challenges that will need to be paid attention to everything from privacy to cybersecurity, but also ensuring that there's adequate access to, uh, to these technologies by everybody. Let me point to a third, uh, uh, my third final major trend, and this is the growth and broadening and deepening of global flows. Now, some of this has already been touched on by Sean, but let me just highlight a few other aspects of it. Uh, at least in our thinking, we think it's important to think about all the things of economic value uh, that basically flow in the world. So it's not only just goods and services or financial flows, but also people who are moving with ideas, the ability to participate in economies uh, and share perspectives. But even more important from a technology standpoint is a spectacular underlying enablement of all of these things that data and communications infrastructure have done. As you can see, we've seen probably the most spectacular growth happen globally around the flow of data and information around the world. And this is creating many, many more uh, new uh, possibilities that uh, uh, create exciting opportunities. One of the things that's worth noting as you put all the pieces together, both the trade services, financial flows, is that they've now reached about 26 trillion. Uh, just even including and despite of the recent hiccup that we saw in the financial flows through the crisis. And as we look at it, uh, barring some whole scale retreat from globalization, these global flows are going to triple by 2025. What you see on the right are three scenarios. Uh, the one in the middle is one that just assumes current, moment, current trends. The one on the left, which is the one that shows the slowdown, is, is one that assumes some significant slowdown. And then the one on the far right assumes uh, even more continued momentum. And it, under any of these scenarios, it's hard to imagine this slowing down quite dramatically. I think the thing that's important to note about this uh, are the following. One is the, there's a strong relationship between the extent to which a country participates in these flows and its economic growth. In fact, uh, through various models and analysis, we can show that, in fact, uh, participation in these global flows can account for somewhere between 15 and 25 percent of global GDP growth. And it's even more important to know that the most participant, participating countries and the most connected countries get an even greater impact in, on their GDP growth when they participate in these flows. Uh, 
Second, it's worth noting that uh, if you look at the structure of these flows, if you had looked at this 20 years ago, these would have been dominated by the very large countries and the very large multinational corporations. That picture has changed quite significantly. Now when you draw the map, whether it's looking at data flows, at trade flows, goods flows, financial flows, you see many, many more participants from including small countries, smaller countries, smaller companies, and even individuals. And I think that's in some ways the most exciting part, which is it's, it seems to be that this is becoming both not only broad and deeper, but involving more and more participants. The last point I'll make is that uh, it used to be the case that if you looked at the intensities involved in these flows, whether you look at which of these flows were labor intensive, capital intensive, and knowledge intensive, labor intensive flows tended to dominate in value. But that picture is actually now changing. Now knowledge intensive flows are as significant as capital and labor intensive flows. And in fact, the knowledge intensive flows seem to be growing slightly faster than the other uh, intensities that you can examine. And this picture shows at least a map of the involvement and participation in knowledge intensive flows by different countries. And as you can see, most of this is dominated by the advanced economies plus China. And I think it's going to be important as we think about investing in the growth and development of the entire planet that, in fact, other countries uh, build capacity and there's enough investment that goes into building capacity to be able to build the kind of capabilities that allow countries to participate in knowledge-intensive flows. Let me close with some observations about some challenges looming ahead. Uh, the first of those is, in fact, the pressure on resources. Uh, we know that mostly due to demand from developing economies, there's going to be incredible and continued pressure on resources of every kind. And in fact, uh, this is only going to continue uh, before it gets any better. So think about how we manage the, re the pressure on resources uh, while we're trying to sustain and encourage economic development is going to be quite important. The second uh, challenge that's worth highlighting, and Sean alluded to this, are, is dealing with the after effects of uh, debt and deleveraging post the recession. Uh, we know that, and that's going to be important uh, to do because funding sustainable development the old way will be a challenge if, in fact, we're going to rely on governments uh, to fund most of, the, uh, most of the development. We know that, uh, so far, most of the advanced economies have hardly begun to deleverage uh, from the excesses of the last uh, decade or two. And, in fact, I think it's only the United States and, and Australia that have a, uh, a, debt to, a total system debt-to-GDP ratio that's starting to fall. And so this is going to be important to, uh, to think about that. At the same time, we know that uh, the time and period when we had access to cheap capital may, in fact, be coming to an end. At the moment, in most advanced economies, interest rates are essentially close to zero. And that only means there's only one way those can go, and it'll be up. It's just a question of when and how fast. So, and and, and that will be important to take into account because we know that demand for capital is only going to get stronger, particularly for industrializing and urbanizing developing economies. We know, for example, that China's capital stock per capita is still less than about 15,000, uh, which is a fraction of what it is, say, for Germany, which is close to about 100,000, and the United States at about uh, 130,000. And we know that in Africa, the infrastructure needs are still even greater. So the need for infrastructure is going to probably put more demands on access to capital, which may then put pressure on interest rates. Third, it's important to keep in mind the challenge of inclusive growth and job creation. Uh, this has been the challenge for most economies, both developed and developing, we, and we know that young workers and, and low-skilled workers are probably the hardest hit. And this pressure will only go up, uh, given that most uh, employers are looking for skilled workers, and we know that the world's ability, both in the developed and the developing economies, to meet the skill needs falls short of what's actually required. This will be an important... Uh, consideration. And then lastly, uh, as I close, uh, just a comment about growth and, uh, and uh, what I'll call the productivity uh, Im imperative. Uh, and here I'm not attempting to make a forecast, but I think it's important to, keep a, to, keep, to remember uh, the, uh, the two factors that drive GDP growth. It's expansion in labor capacity and labor pool, as well as growth in productivity. We know that in the last 50 years, uh, we've actually benefited from both. Uh, 
We know that labor grew at nearly 1.7% uh, over the last 50 years, and today we now have close to two, two and a half times more employees than we had in 1964, and we know that productivity also went up. But as we look forward uh, to the next couple of decades, we know that demographic trends are going to weaken and perhaps even start to reverse the growth in labor and uh, labor pools. Uh, we know that they're, li they're likely to drop to somewhere close to 0.3% per annum, and we may even reach peak employment at some level in the next 50 years or so. And so we're going to need to rely on productivity much, much, much more than we've ever had. And this is true for both developed and developing economies. Uh, and so, and, and realizing the productivity challenge uh, that we have facing us, I think is an important thing to keep in mind, and this will not be easy. So in conclusion, I will just uh, conclude by saying that uh, it's gonna be very important for us to think about not just the old ways of doing things, but new ways of doing things as we think about growth and development. In particular, I think it's important to think about how to embrace new actors, the private sector, philanthropy, social entrepreneurs, not just in terms of financial capacity or financing, but also in terms of capability, leveraging their global footprints, their experience, their assets and capabilities. And lastly, it's gonna be important to think about both new sources of financing as well as new models for financing, whether we're talking about domestic resource mobilization, uh, somehow tapping into what's happening with remittances, or even thinking about blended capital models that involve the private sector as ways to think about financing. All of these are important challenges that I put before you as you deliberate over the coming months. Thank you.